So uh, here's something I think maybe talked about. I met a few of you yesterday afternoon, and this, a question like this came up, which is that uh, I think it was great. said uh, that, 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 that there's a lot of companies out there that aren't successful with this, <laughs> and that's certainly true. And I think one of the questions probably that you'll be thinking about by the end of this course more is, you know, why is that? A lot of this makes perfect common sense. So why on earth would people not work this way? So it's a question that we can't fully answer. We have a whole lot of, we can aim at the answers. We know a lot of pieces to it. But uh, exactly why that is, I think if we knew the answer, we'd probably have a higher success rate. But not all these change initiatives work. A lot of them fail. So one of the things I think that you'll want to think about the rest of this class and the rest of your whole career is what failure modes are there? How can we ameliorate those? The other is what success factors? How can we get things to work to work better? Uh, so it raises the raise question, and I'm not going to answer it for you, except to say that uh, why doesn't everybody act this way with lean thinking? And one, question, one possibility is they want to. And there are a lot of uh, company managers that think that's what it's about. Uh, it's not working here because people don't want them to. We're going to make them want to. <laughs> but I don't know if that's really it. I haven't seen that many people when they get a chance to know what they don't want to. And I've been around this for a long time. I'll talk about that in a minute. More likely is that they don't know what it is. They never, they never heard of it. Or if they heard of it, they heard about it in the wrong way. And they said, no, I don't want that. <laughs> Here's another one that's really likely. They kind of know what it is and say, okay, that sounds good, I guess. We don't know what to do. And this would be the case of a lot of engineers and managers out there. Okay, lean sounds good. I've read the books. I like it. They don't really know what to do to make this work. And that's a real common thing out there. And another is, even if you kind of know, you know, you know, people aren't perfect. And we have these, deep, these habits, deeply embedded habits, that aren't necessarily that easy to change. So changing those habits becomes part of what we have to think about. So as you, and you will learn, if you haven't already, the technical part of how to design a good job. I have confidence in that. You also have to learn the other side, which is when you're designing a job, it's for a human being. So there's the social side. And you didn't sign up in industrial engineering to become a psychologist. <laughs> but I got bad news for you. <laughs> Along the way, you're going to have to kind of become an armchair psychologist. So helping people change their habits. And another part, it's not just a matter of habits that are superficial things. I mean, there's a fundamental piece to this about how to change the way people work together uh, in teams, whether it's a sports team or it's a team uh, at work. Um, making change there is, is not a trivial thing. So I'm going to share a little bit of personal stuff. I did a little bit before, and I mentioned I'm, I'm actually from the Tennessee River Valley. I, I, my, I'm from a family who moved around the Tennessee River from Kentucky to Tennessee to northern Alabama, building dams and steam plants and stuff. Ended up at the University of Tennessee. Um, and in the, midst, in the 1970s, that's when this thing called Japanese production, Japanese management became a big deal. Uh, and uh, uh, J, JT was, was there and remembers this. Uh, most of you weren't there and don't remember this. Uh, some other people don't remember it for various reasons we won't get into from the 1970s. <laughs> Uh, but I, I read all these books. I got to meet almost like I'm, well, a little bit the way I'm coming here now, actually, at Tennessee. There was, there, was a, there was a professor from Harvard that came down and started talking about all these great things. Actually, he'd written a book. Remember Ezra Vogel, CT? Ezra Vogel. He wrote a book called Japan is Number One. He said, Japan is taking over the world. Looking back on it, it's so silly. It's a tiny little country. And they did some amazing things there for a while, but, but they weren't going to take over the world. But they were taking over industry in an amazing way in the 70s. Um, and there was a lot of fear about it. So I decided to go off and learn what they did. I graduated from the University of Tennessee. I'd never met a Japanese person. <laughs> Everybody had sushi, right? I'd never had sushi. We didn't have, there were no sushi bars in Tennessee back then. Um, so I went off to Japan, 1977. Did not speak a word of Japanese. Had never had to buy sushi. Um, and I visited a bunch of companies. Uh, Fujitsu, Matsushita, Nissan. That was great. I, and then later then, I, I, I worked to get a, uh, an internship at Fujitsu, a Japanese company. So, uh, and I, I liked what I was learning about uh, Japan. I wanted to work for the biggest, most Japanese company I could find. Because I still thought it was a Japanese thing. Right, JT? That's what we... A lot, of people, a lot of people said back then, that's what I thought it was. So, okay, if it's a Japanese thing, I'll work for the biggest Japanese company I can find. There were no Japanese companies around <laughs> in the Midwest back, back, back then. Uh, that would be me, uh, wearing a, uh, like a summer kimono, going to this little day. This is fun. I said, this, sounds like, this is a good thing to, to learn more about. And as it turned out, I was really kind of lucky. I landed in Toyota City. And I found myself exactly doing what I was looking for. But instead of this, now I'm working on the assembly line. Because <laughs> the way you learn this is through getting your hands dirty. You actually have to do it. Some of it is so deceptively simple. It's like, well, sure, why would you do that? It's just industrial engineering that we've been doing since the 1930s. Well, yes and no. There's, there's a lot of it that's deceptively simple. There's more to it as, as you are learning. But it was what I was looking for, the best production management systems. But what I didn't know is it wasn't a Japanese thing at all. It turned out, for whatever set of reasons, last night JT you know, referred to them as geniuses. And I don't know if they were or not. But, but something genius happened there. A lot of different influences and things came together. By happenstance, probably. No one knows. You look at all kinds of things in human history. You don't really know why it happened. But after the fact, you can identify that certain special things happened. Whether it was Italy in the 1600s or what happened here in Toyota City. Starting about 1950 up to right the time that I got there, uh, 1980. What else do I have here? All right, so when I got there, uh, they only hired me. I only worked for the biggest, most Japanese company I could find. Uh, and Toyota then hired me only for one reason, which was that they had just signed an agreement with General Motors for a 50-50 joint venture to build cars together in California. They'd never done that before. They'd never, they'd never put their complete system in place anywhere outside of Japan, even anywhere outside of Toyota City. There's a place called Toyota City. <laughs> Everybody there works for the company. There's a company store. There's a company hospital. Uh, everything. So I, was, I landed there then, 1983. It was me and 70,000 Japanese. Trying to figure out how we're going to transfer this thing overseas. It was great for me because before I could help them do that, they had to teach me first. There's not another, there not another non-Japanese there. And it was fun as can be uh, in a whole lot of ways, trying to understand how this worked. 